G'day everyone, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Pole Position with Guardian Australia and Essential Media. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to the traditional owners and to elders past and present. We do these webinars, well, these ones in particular, we do fortnightly, but we do other ones uh, and they vary from um, week to week in terms of days and time. So head on over to the Australia Institute.org.au for all the upcoming webinars. You can register for them all for free on our website. <clears throat> Just a few tips before we begin today to make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, you should be able to see a Q&A button where you can type in questions for our panelists in the second half of this webinar. You should also be able to upvote other people's questions and make comments on them as well. Um, please keep being civil and on topic in the chat or we will boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded. It'll be posted up on australiainstitute.tv, that's our YouTube channel, um, within the next 24 hours. So Pole Position, for those who are newcomers, is the show where fortnightly we unpack the big political issues and dive into the latest polling trends from the fortnightly Guardian Essential Report. And unsurprisingly, this week's poll really focuses on Australia's pandemic um, response, on border closures, vaccinations, what people think about the national plan and their confidence in it. Um, and most of the east coast of Australia remains in lockdown here in Canberra. Today we just got the news our lockdown's been extended until mid-October. Um, but if you want a little of your faith in humanity restored, uh, we had some troubles with the vaccination clinic at the AIS. Head on over to the ABC Canberra uh, Facebook page and watch all the lovely comments from people um, thanking ACT Health and everyone who went back to get a vaccination at midnight last night so, so we didn't waste any. Um, that's what's keeping me happy today, despite the fact that in the last 24 hours, Canberra seems to have sold out of petunias as well. Um, and we've got other issues to discuss. Um, obviously, we saw the Women's Safety Summit um, uh, in Canberra, um, issues with the Prime Minister travelling for Father's Day. It's been uh, a lot happening in politics. And I'm delighted to welcome back our regular panellist, Catherine Murphy, political editor of Guardian Australia, Pete Lewis, executive director at Essential Media, Richard Dennis, chief economist at the Australia Institute, and John Remington from Essential as well. Welcome to all of you, Catherine. I will start with you here in the extended glorious lockdown of the ACT. Um, it has been a couple of uh, big weeks in politics. I was saying just before we logged on here, I was a bit depressed last week, but my mood has enhanced a little bit. But things are still pretty dire out there. Well, let me not bring you down, Eb. That seems a bad way to begin the session by bringing Eb down further. Um, but no, uh, yours was a very good summary just of the last couple of weeks in terms of milestones. Obviously, COVID and the management of COVID continues to dominate uh, political cycles, both uh, federally and within the Federation, as everybody will be abundantly aware of who's uh, on with us for the chat today. So COVID has dominated, but also uh, we've had a couple of other issues. Uh, one was the Women's Summit that it referred to a minute ago. Uh, that was a virtual summit uh, last week, which was connected to the next 10-year uh, National Women's Safety Plan. Uh, I watched both days. Uh, it was a really fascinating exercise from a lot of different perspectives and uh, one of the, uh, again, keeping Eb's spirits high, let me focus on the positives. Uh, it was really brilliant to see uh, women grab the microphone, both in that event and outside it. Uh, and, uh, and there were a lot of good contributions, a uh, lot of interesting reflections and thoughts and uh, a number of, uh, I think, uh, people sort of resisted the tendency that one has when you participate in something like that to be co-opted by the event. People made their points, I think, fearlessly and fairly. Uh, the other thing, as Ed mentioned, was there was a bit of controversy around the Prime Minister's return to Sydney for Father's Day. That certainly uh, lit the news cycle up for a few days. Um, 
the difficulty with that is uh, uh, the prime minister is not always uh, frank about, uh, you know, many things. <laughs> and, uh, in this instance, it would have gone a whole lot better for them, I think, had uh, had there just been a routine communication around the fact that the prime minister intended to return to Sydney for the weekend and had an exemption to return to Canberra for obvious serious business. Uh, I think, you know, people in the community, of course, understand that the Prime Minister is working very hard and he hasn't seen his family for quite a long period of time. Uh, I think everyone gets that. The, the problem was that the trip wasn't disclosed and it, it, it really hit a raw nerve in the country in terms of people who have been separated from their extended families now for many months and have no certainty about when any, you know, any reunions uh, could occur. So anyway, that was lively in the news cycle for a couple of days. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, and so, Pete, we might dive into the slides in just a sec, but um, obviously everyone's been focused for the most part on COVID and the pandemic response. And we have seen um, kind of a lot of discussion around the Doherty modelling, the assumptions in it. Um, New South Wales is kind of headed uh, towards opening up. Um, there's a lot of debate out there. Tell me about your column today. So I've framed the column around the, um, the construct of the trolley dilemma. For those that um, haven't heard of the trolley dilemma, it's a mind experiment to test um, your ethical framework, which says that you um, you see a, a tram going down the tracks that is going to hit five workers and kill them. You've got access to a lever. Do you pull the lever and it will only kill one person? And so the, 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 the essence is, will you intervene in a way which you know is going to harm somebody in order to protect others? And there's a whole bunch of different formulations of the trolley dilemma. What happens if the single person's pushing a pram or... What happens if there's no lever, but you can throw a fat man in front of the tram? And it, it's all about trying to force you to articulate um, and, and, and work through the ethical dilemmas around decisions which have the effect of harming people. And I think it's, it's worth looking at the current place our decision makers and us as a broader society are in through the frame of the, um, the trolley dilemma, because it makes us think through what are we actually doing at the moment, which is consciously hitting a lever when we reach a certain rate of vaccination, which we know is going to kill people who would not otherwise die. And to actually be honest enough to think that through and unpack that, I think is a real test of national leadership, which I am pretty sure the current crop aren't up to um, meeting. Yeah, just before we go to the slides, Richard, I want to come to you. We've talked a lot about um, the fact that governments put a value on human life all the time, and it's not necessarily uh, what people might think. But um, is Pete right there about the ethical dilemmas that we're facing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when if you have a car accident, and you're in intensive care and you stay in a coma for months, we'll spend millions of dollars to keep you alive. No problem at all. But there are people out there whose lives would be saved or significantly improved with drugs where we've said, oh, that's a bit expensive to list on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. So we make these decisions all the time, but they're usually done privately. They're usually done in a small room and then they're glossed over with a whole bunch of kind of polite banalities about, you know, the importance of getting the decisions right. Whereas, as Pete just described, if we open up at 70% adult vaccination, if we open up at 80% adult vaccination, there'll be 9.2 million unvaccinated Australians. And we kind of know to the decimal place uh, about what percentage of those people will wind up in hospital. And we're pretty good at, ac at estimating how many of them are going to die. And we're making that decision in full view. And the government spent weeks trying to throw the Doherty Institute under the bus. But it's really interesting. The last week, you probably haven't heard as much about Doherty. And that's for the simple reason that all the assumptions the Doherty model made are so out of date for the decisions for which they're now being put that I think it's actually become embarrassing to the Prime Minister and Gladys to say 
the Doherty modelling says we should do this because it doesn't. It does the word should is not mentioned in there at all. Uh, and the optimistic assumptions in the Doherty modelling are what got them through. Just finally, it's a mass, you know, there was an enormous pile on an Anastasia Palaszczuk for using the worst case scenario in the Doherty modelling. But there's never been any criticism of anyone using the best case scenario in the Doherty modelling. Uh, it's modelling, it's a bunch of scenarios and things have moved so fast. Those scenarios don't even really help us predict because more people are going to get sick and die, a lot more people probably than the Doherty modelling anticipated. Yeah, and um, we might go to the slides in a second, but Richard, you were pointing out that a lot of, like these are ultimately, we can have the health advice, but these are democratic decisions that have to be made in the open. Always, always, and they should be made in the open. And and it was never true that ever, anyone was just doing what the health advice said, but it's obvious true there has been a pivot now, now that Gladys Berejiklian does not want to follow the health first advice all of a sudden she's adamant that she never really did. When at the beginning she was adamant, I'm doing this because this is what the health advice says. So uh, there's, there's no right answer to the ethical dilemmas that Pete described. And everyone values their own life a lot higher than they value other people's lives. And unfortunately, proximity to pain and proximity to death has a big impact on the way humans sort of evaluate the the pros and the cons of these things. Yeah, so we might go now um, to the slideshow here. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to play it from the start here. And just to Richard's point, Ebony, the, the extra piece is the conscious intervention in an action, which I think is a really interesting piece that even comes up in this this question. So views towards opening international borders. So assuming people want to lift borders at some point, what is the point? We've got 20% who basically say, yeah, we've got to accept some deaths to reopen our borders as the cost of remaining closed is too high. So they're prepared to hit the lever now. We've got another lot that say that we can't accept any deaths that could be prevented by keeping borders closed. That's about a third. And then you've got 45% who want to go hasten slowly and take every reasonable step to minimise death, even if it means slowing our reopening. Those different tensions are, it's not a third, a third, a third, but you've got, you've got sizable groups on each side of that debate and a mass in the middle, which is going to take, and it's not like a normal policy decision where it's just land it and then move on. We're going to be living with the decision over the over the summer and well into next year, and this is where I think there is this real challenge of leadership. And you know, poor old Gladys was trying to articulate it the other week, and her words were, "Death is horrible, but there are eight million citizens who don't have a choice on how they spend their free time." Like that is not the the moral um, <laughs> setup that I think is going to carry national unity through this, and. You know, while we might all have our partisan views, this is this actually seems like a moment if we're going down this path of some form of reopening, um, we've got to do it all together, or it's going to be a really, really, um, you know, divisive period. I think. Hey, yeah. There will be there will be funerals, but we 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 can attend them. Yeah, um, but Catherine, like to me, that Pete's point there is, you know there isn't a consensus there. There are wildly different views in the community. Yeah, and I think that's that's something we need to bear in mind. Uh, there's, there's the moral and ethical dilemmas that uh, Pete and Richard have canvassed just in their remarks uh, a minute ago, but also, uh, you know, I suppose leadership happens in a dynamic environment. I mean, that's a statement of the obvious, but, but it does. Um, I think we're sort of uh, on, we're moving through a transition from um, the very heightened response to COVID that we had in Australia that characterised much of last year in terms of uh, quite considerable government action, both Commonwealth and states, uh, and considerable community buy in for restrictions, uh, you know, public health measures. Uh, you know, we, we did have this period where there was, there, where there was this lives and livelihoods consensus in, 
in our polity. Um, now we're, we're in a fatigue point in the pandemic, uh, views in the community. Well, I think uh, as we work through the slides, I think everybody on today will, will sort of uh, get the caution that, that is coming through in all of these different metrics in terms of the public, right? The, the public is cautious about this transition that we're making now for obvious reasons. But one of the, the challenges is, is moving from that very ramped up period to what happens as, as COVID moves from pandemic to endemic, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, we see it in the lockdowns. There's been less compliance this year than there was last year with lockdowns. It's been a factor in Sydney. It's clearly a factor in Melbourne, less so in Canberra. So, um, you know, this is a bit amorphous, this concept, but it's sort of like there are the sharp uh, moral and ethical dilemmas, but then there's also the practicality of, of what leaders can ask communities to do and for how long. And, and that's what we're seeing playing out through all of these questions in this fortnight's poll. Yeah, uh, so we've got in front of us, I mean, as much as we've asked about international borders, I think all the focus has been on state border closures. And while the PM doesn't seem in a great hurry to open international borders, he's quite happy to put the pressure on the, the states. Um, but that's quite a significant chunk there, Pete, who want states to be allowed to keep their borders closed for as long as they think is necessary. Mm -hmm. In is that the, WA in the figures there? Well, well that... John, will, John will help me out with this on a state breakdown in a sec. But, you know, you, you can again see the split. Um, so I think that the key takeout is that lifting restrictions and opening borders aren't necessarily, you know, they're, they're not the same thing. And I think the Prime Minister's been trying to group them together. It's much more nuanced than the borders. So you've got 41% um, as people can see, and, and I, the numbers... John will jump in in a sec, are much stronger in the lockdown states or the states with, with zero COVID, I should say. Um, but then also this interesting split on what 80% actually means, um, plus 16 or, you know, including children. So, John, you can help me now. Yeah, and you've, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there. Queensland, there's 55% of those who think the borders should be able to stay closed as long as possible compared to 41 overall, 67 in Western Australia. So Queensland and Western Australia are really keen on managing their own borders in that sense. When it comes to the split, the main one we see between the states is Victoria, where we've got 30% of Victorians who want the 80% figure to include ch um, children as well as adults. And that's more like um, between 15 and 25% in the other states. But it really does show that this isn't a national pandemic. It's happening differently in different states. And the attempts to impose uniform rules is, again, something that's likely to end in tears. Yeah, um, I can see we've got nearly a thousand people on the line with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. These are the latest results from today's Guardian Essential poll. Um, we've heard a lot about the national plan to reopen safely. Uh, Pete. Well, this speaks, speaks for itself. Like the plan was a mantra for a few weeks there. A quarter of us reckon they understand the plan and they're up for it. 40% um, reckon they know it, but <laughs> don't have confidence in it. 15% um, not really aware and don't understand it or aware and don't understand. It, and then 20% haven't even heard of it. So again, the challenge of building a consumer community consensus, if you put those two right bars on top of each other, you're at 35% of people that are out, um, add to the 39% who don't have confidence. And this is not, it is not carrying a national unity message at the moment, is at least what those figures say to me. Yeah, Richard, um, part of me thinks that a lot of that is because we're still not at the peak in New South Wales. The health system already seems to be buckling um, or at least hugely under stress and I guess everyone knows it's inevitable um, you know that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better um, is, is that do you think that's what we can read into those results that people just have, have a good idea what's coming down the, the line 
Yeah, I do. And I, I think across all the questions we've looked at today, there's around a quarter of the population that are kind of with the government, you know, whether that's with opening up or understanding the plan. And there's three quarters of the population that are either opposed or confused. And, you know, Tony Abbott did well sort of saying, if you don't understand something, don't support it. Uh, it's going to be hard for Scott Morrison to kind of delve into the details of this plan and tell people, come on, come with me, because all the premiers can't agree on what the details of the plan mean. Uh, and just to jump to the politics of this, I mean, the coalition strongholds are Western Australia and Queensland, and Western Australia and Queensland are pretty, pretty, pretty determined to avoid what New South Wales is about to go through. And I say about to because it's barely started yet. So I must admit there's a lot happening in the country I don't understand at the moment. Things are going to get pretty bad in Sydney over the next two months. The rest of the country is going to look in, and I don't think looking in to New South Wales is going to make people think, oh, well, I think well, I'll have that. what they're having. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't mean to be flippant. It's terrible what's going to happen. Uh, when I say going to happen, I mean, we can, we can see the progression of the number of people with the disease. We can see the rate of transmission. We can see the rate of hospitalisation. We can project all this stuff. And, you know, Gladys putting out a model of what's going to happen in the 12 LGAs is very nice. But... COVID's growing far faster outside the 12 LGAs because lockdowns work. So the rest of New South Wales is going to catch up. And she's putting out modelling saying, oh, it won't be too bad if we just look at this one bit. Well, that's true. In three months' time, most people in that LGA will have already had it if they haven't been vaccinated. So I just can't quite figure out what Scott Morrison is hoping the takeout lesson for Queenslanders uh, West Australians and Tasmanians is going to be watching what happens in New South Wales unfold. I can't get my head around it. I'm missing something. Yeah, Catherine, I was also really struck by um, Gladys Berejiklian more or less coming out and saying, I'm going to stop these daily press conferences. We'll only do it when we need it before New South Wales has even hit the peak. Do you think she's walked back from that already? Uh, well, sort of looks like it this week. She did front uh, yesterday. I don't think she did today, but uh, but she did yesterday. Just to, I'll I'll get to Gladys and the outrage, but um, but just in terms of um, that that picking up from Richard's last point, like what is what is the prime minister hoping to achieve? Um, well, it sort of it just sort of underscores like the the differences across uh, in different parts of the country underscore the fact that this this 18 months or however long we've been in the pandemic um, has seen the return of the states to the fore. Like if you speak to anyone in politics at the moment, they say the, the federal, what's happening federally feels very remote from their lived experience right now. People are identifying with conditions in their state, with messaging in their state, either for good or for bad, and, and things are much more sort of, uh, uh, well, fragmented than we've seen over in recent history in Australia where the Commonwealth has been very assertive and the states less so. And it's, it's just as a you know, kind of as a shift in governance, it's actually really fascinating. Um, but anyway, so what is the Prime Minister hoping to achieve? Well, not really clear, is it? Um, but in terms of the, the, the lockdowns and, and reopening versus not, I think uh, obviously the Prime Minister has been carrying the plan message, but the chief evangelist in the government federally for reopening has actually been the Treasurer rather than the Prime Minister, if we look a bit closely. Anyway, setting that to one side, Gladys and the outrage. Well, yes, I was honestly astonished. I really was last week. Um, I, I still... I still can't express my astonishment adequately that uh, a leader before the, the peak of the outbreak in her own state would, would suggest that now was the time to appear when she had something to say rather than when valid questions need to be put and hopefully answered. Um, I, I do just think that is extraordinary. Uh, an, an extraordinary and arrogant thing to say and do as a political leader. Uh, it obviously hasn't gone very well for her because she's already reappeared. Uh, and I hope uh, people in New South Wales will keep pressure on their political leaders. This is a democracy. 
it's not, you know, uh, being accountable for your decisions is, is not optional. It's not something you do when you feel like it, not when you don't. Um, these are very serious times. Literally, they could not be more serious. And, uh, and the Premier is making a bunch of decisions for which she is accountable. Yeah. Um, keeping going through the results, uh, we've got a, a huge majority there, Pete, that are booked in or have had their first mm -hmm. dose. That's looking good. Yep, um, the number that say they'll never get vaccinated at its lowest level, 6%. 14% um, say they will, but they haven't yet. Um, my colleague, Gavin White, who's been doing quite a bit of research and this reckons this is almost like I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but crowd um, and the views of the 14 and the 6 are pretty similar. So it does set up that dynamic, doesn't it, that we're going to have an 80-20 in the adult population between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, and that may well become the next fault line in Australian politics. Um, we also have this really strong support for mandatory vaccinations across the board. So the high 80s in health, 70% in schools and traveling, um, even to shop at a retail store, 58% pitching for mandatory vaccination and 58 students to attend school. So, um, you know, on one level, um, you can see, as I think Catherine was saying earlier, the individuation of the response to the pandemic, put it on the individuals to get vaccinated. But also, I think at the same time, this sense that it is an individual act that creates collective um, safety and resilience. And, and, and managing those conversations is going to be interesting. It's something we're going to go in the field and maybe discuss more in a fortnight what is driving the 20% that won't get vaccinated? Is it um, distrust in the system, distrust in um, science? Um, and can we, you know, is the challenge in dealing with the unvaccinated to, to, to extract them from the, um, the pack and saying you can't be part of society or find a way of bringing them in? Mm -hmm. Can I just can I just point out that eighty three percent of people want their health workers vaccinated, which suggests there's some anti vaxxers that don't want an unvaccinated health worker. <laughs> That's kind of yeah, twelve percent. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine, you were going to say something. No, oh, um, also just in that uh, vaccine hesitant and anti and and harder line anti vaxxers. Um, we need to bear in mind uh, the impact of uh, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, I did a podcast, my, my weekend podcast, uh, the last one I spoke to uh, Chris Bowen and Michelle Rowland, two um, federal Western Sydney based MPs, both of whom raised some really astonishing examples of uh, of information or fake information that's out there. Um, Chris Bowen told me that the Bishop of um, uh, one of the Syrian churches in his community had to had to write a Facebook post telling people that the vaccine wasn't the mark of the devil uh, because no well I mean you laugh but yeah, God, the information awesome. is 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 literally proliferating um, and uh, and that's that 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 is part of the hesitancy story here that that there are people profiting you know, in, in low information or low engagement environments. And, and we're also seeing some political actors organising around that as well, um, which is a really significant issue, given that this, you know, isn't a seminar, it isn't a drill, lives are literally on the line, uh, people's livelihoods, people's businesses are on the line. Um, it'd be great if people weren't lying to people, but uh, there's a fair bit of lying going on around the place. Mm. Um, just to take us through these last couple of slides, um, this kind of takes us back to um, this, you know, heading towards a peak in New South Wales. Um, a lot of people there, Pete, already saying that their state's health system is already struggling. Yeah. Um, so to Richard's point before, I think there is a sense of impending doom, although having been out and socially distantly about in Sydney last weekend um, on a beautiful spring day, it did feel like in a lot of people's minds, it's all over already and this is what's coming down the tracks at us. Yeah. Um, Richard, do those numbers um, 
shock you in any way or is that roughly what you'd expect that people are can already see that um, the health systems are straining. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I much admit I watched less television news than I used to, but you would have thought what a what better time for that visual medium than to mm. show people kind of some of the realities of this. But, of course, for all sorts of privacy reasons, you know, hospitals are the last place you can actually show images from so i really Although don't... the queues of ambulances and the ramping has become almost the visual motif hasn't it Richard? well indeed i was going to say really all we can show is is ambulances but uh, you know ambulances aren't nearly as bad as what uh perhaps people might imagine is happening inside and the same is true in the u.s like i actually saw a terrible story with a doctor standing at the front of the hospital saying day in and day out, I, I hear people who don't believe this virus is deadly. I, I'm not allowed to show them what's happening behind these walls. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's only through secondhand accounts, but the number of secondhand accounts and, you know, stories of people that are dying in hospitalization at home. I mean, is that really a thing? Hospital mm. at home, um, you know, people coughing up blood while hospitaling at home. Uh, who then have trouble getting an ambulance to an actual hospital, uh, I think those stories are going to become louder and clearer and more persuasive in the next month or two. Do you, yeah. do you want to just speak to the next slide? I think it's got a, an age breakdown here. This is really, really interesting. So this is the experience of younger people through the pandemic, and this is almost the other side of the equation of the impacts of the pandemic. So we had... Um, over 50% of people under the age of 35 saying their overall mental health had declined. Um, people are seeing their GPs less often. They're not getting the checks they normally had. So the other part of this is not just the wave of um, as, as the, the virus rips across the community, it's going to be the flow on effects of people that haven't been having their health seen to over the last couple of years and particularly younger people. So, I think, you know, when you go back to the trolley dilemma, that's the other side of the equation. The lockdown is um, having real impacts um, across the community and particularly at younger people are also bearing the economic brunt of this. Yeah, I was going to say, so uh, it really is, um, obviously the actual disease uh, was made uh, older people much more vulnerable, but in terms of the impact of lockdowns and other things, we've certainly seen that impact born a lot more by young people who are essential workers looking at a couple of these you know what makes lockdowns bearable having and being in your own home having a backyard you know if you're a young person whose employment is precarious and you're only renting you know if you live in western sydney without um, access to green spaces and all those kinds of things that make lockdown um, bearable uh, you can see why there'd be these disproportionate um, impacts. Richard, um, just quickly on uh, jobs um, during uh, lockdowns and things, have we seen a disproportionate impact on young people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we know the sectors that have been hit hardest, entertainment in particular, uh, restaurants and cafes, uh, so those those sectors disproportionately employ a lot of young people. They've been hit particularly hard. We know that casuals have been hit hard, not not in terms of industry, but as a employment classification. Guess what? Uh, uh, young people and women more likely to be casuals. So in turn, especially without JobKeeper, uh, it makes a lot more sense in inverted commas for employers to to shed that staff. The exact opposite of what JobKeeper was designed. Uh, to stop happening. Uh, and, you know, of course, the, you know, the tourism industry uh, has just been decimated. Um, and whilst universities uh, don't employ a lot of young people, uh, boy, a lot of young people's lives have been adversely affected by what's happened within universities. So, uh, look, I hate to say it, that's really the Australian way, isn't it? We, we load up the pain on young people. Whenever we change a policy, we always say we grandfather it which means we look after old people and load up the pain on the young. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Catherine, just going through um, this last slide here on the Women's Safety Summit, um, about a third of people not that confident it's going to result in meaningful changes to address violence against women and children. Uh, you were saying um, 
earlier in your wrap up that um, obviously uh, there's a lot of good people there and a lot of good will, but there seems to be quite a, a lot of sense too that governments have had plans and um, action plans for ages and we're still just not mm. seeing any difference. Yeah, well, and that was a key message that I really uh, genuinely hope the government heard uh, because it was a very consistent message across a range of participants in the Women's Summit uh, and uh, also uh, Indigenous, a number of Indigenous women uh, who participated in the summit were very much of the view, and it makes complete sense, uh, that Indigenous uh, people need their own plan that, uh, that marries better with the way uh, health and social services are delivered to uh, uh, First Nations communities. And uh, on, the, on the plus side of the ledger, uh, the government has pretty much acknowledged that that will need to happen in the second 10-year uh, plan. So that's good. Um, the, but, you know, the difficulty was, I suppose I, I was given pause towards the end because... Um, the the uh, minister for women Maurice Payne uh, was was quite irritated by the end of the event. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, I think she saw some of the blowback that sort of happened in almost live action through the summit. Um, I think she sort of saw some of that as being politically motivated rather than uh, people honest speaking their truths and and reflecting their decades of professional experience in, this, in these areas and their experience as victim survivors. Um, so if that's the headspace, the default, the default headspace that, it, you know, that this is sort of, um, that this is, uh, that, that criticism is political, uh, look, some of it will be, <laughs> obviously, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it's practical. A lot of it is, was experts of various types saying, look, these initiatives are great, um, but we need to restructure them. We need to think about how they're delivered because there's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of uh, really important service delivery that has to constantly beg for funding, which doesn't you know, allow services to be delivered efficiently. I, I do hope uh, look, I was in the I was in the Prime Minister's courtyard on the day where the Prime Minister effectively invited Maurice Payne and her female cabinet colleagues to, uh, you know, be the Prime Minister for women. Uh, I was I was there that day. Um, I think it's very important that these folks take the opportunity that that the sort of that the cultural shift of this year has given them to really take these issues up within the government and get the best possible national plan that we can emerge with. I genuinely think this is a significant test. Um, look, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know yet whether they will they will meet the test or not. But um, you know, if they don't, it'll be a pretty big fail in full public view. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to a few questions from the audience now, and then we might come back uh, towards the end to um, some of the overall uh, final results from the poll today. Um, the first one uh, that I was going to ask is from Alan Colagado, who asks, is it right to open up at 70% full vaccination, even if a majority of the 30% who aren't are the most vulnerable or disadvantaged in the community. Catherine, we have talked about, um, you know, that these are all democratic questions, but, you know, you've just talked about Indigenous populations there. We know their vaccination rates are lagging way behind the rest of the community. And still, I think we're having problems in aged care, in healthcare workers, in essential workers being vaccinated. Um, how much of an issue is that going to be as we start opening up? No, it's significant. Um, but I think one of the interesting things in the debate around the plan and the Doherty modelling over the past three weeks or so is that all governments have taken a bit of a step back from 70%. At one point, 70% was the magic number. At one, one point, 70% was Freedom Day before a bunch of political leaders then reframed the debate and said, oh, no one was ever talking about Freedom Day. Um, I think we're now sort of moving uh, towards 80% being the actual threshold for significant changes. 
although obviously the New South Wales opening plan, you know, various things happen at 70%. But look, what public health experts have been saying throughout this whole debate about how and when you normalise, how and when you open up, uh, that vaccine equity is important, is, is as is as important. Sorry, can't speak today, as the national thresholds. Right? Like, uh, if you talk about a seventy percent thresholds of of people vaccinated, that's people over sixteen at a national level. Uh, that picture may look quite different. In, in localised areas, in areas where there is significant vaccine hesitancy or lack of service delivery or whatever else. And Kerry Chant has said a number of times to my, in my hearing that uh, we, the response will only be as strong as our weakest link. And what she means is, uh, she means that vaccine equity point that uh, it, you can't sort of talk about uh, 70 or 80% in, in some sort of national abstracted form you have to look more closely about whether those those rates are replicated in in smaller areas that may in fact see outbreaks that cause um, not only decimation in vulnerable communities but also that makes it more problematic from a public health management system going ahead. Yeah, Richard, there's a lot of people expressing huge concern about what's going to happen to Indigenous populations and communities, um, you know, after we've had such success about keeping the virus out of there through Aboriginal community controlled health organisations just really stepping up and really leading the world, doing better than a lot of other First Nations um, have done in other countries um, in this pandemic, but also a lot of questions around the modeling still for people in the in the chat and in the questions here. I've got one from Barbara Van Ernst um, about the Victorian government now referring to Burnett um, Institute modeling for advice. And um, I guess as someone who's been looking a lot at the modeling recently, are there differences, what are the differences between what Burnett was modeling and what Doherty has modeled? Um, yeah, look, good, good questions. I mean, I, I, maybe people should have a look at the explainer video we put up on the Australia Institute TV channel where we, I break down a lot of the Doherty stuff. I mean, it sounds terrible, but I'm, I'm cursed with the willingness to read graphs. And most people don't want to read graphs, and I get it. But boy, if you actually have a look at the Doherty modelling, and I do take you through that with a red pen, uh, it's pretty alarming. And, um, you know, what we're seeing now, so the so we had the Doherty modelling, which, as Catherine said, got turned into it's safe to let rip at 70%. The word safe isn't mentioned in the Doherty modelling. The word should isn't mentioned in the Doherty modelling, right? They just have a whole bunch of scenarios and they say, if you open up like this, then here's about how many cases you'll get. And to give you some perspective, in the good news case, in the best case scenario in the Doherty modelling, in the best case scenario, six months after we open up at 80%, six months after that, we're at 40,000 cases a day. 40,000 cases a day. That's not what most people are picturing with the safe opening up. Uh, so the Burnett Institute have done some modelling uh, for New South Wales, but Gladys has only released some of it and she's only released the part around what's happening in the 12 LGAs, uh, the local government areas. They haven't released what's happening in the, in the rest of Sydney. Now, the idea that cases are going to peak in part of Sydney in mid-October, frankly, who cares? Who cares if it peaks in part of Sydney and it's still growing in the rest of Sydney? You know, the, the, the health system, all those hardworking people are going to get overwhelmed whether it happens in southwest Sydney or the North Shore or the eastern suburbs. Uh, so the Victorian government's from now relying on some Burnett modelling as well, which, if it's the one I think the question refers to, really emphasises the fact that the vaccines are great and please don't anyone interpret anything I'm saying is suggesting don't get vaccinated, you really should. Uh, but it's quite clear from the Doherty modelling and from the Burnett modelling that it's not enough. You know, we had Brendan Crabb, the head of the Burnett Institute, on one of our webinars last week talking about vaccine plus. Now, the problem is, you know, the Prime Minister, Mr Technology Not Taxes, you know, this, we, we're just determined in Australia to factionalise even policy ideas. Uh, we need everyone to get vaccinated as quick as they can and supply would be good, 
but we also still need all this other stuff. And I think it's safe to say the Victorian government are relying a lot more heavily on the other stuff that we need to keep doing, especially watching New South Wales kind of shrug their shoulders and say, oh, we, we had a red hot go for a while there, but gee, gee the weather's picking up. I mean, obviously that uh, angered the Victorian Premier who donated a lot of Pfizer to New South Wales to bring forward picnic day. But guys, isn't the other point that the models inform leadership they they shouldn't be used to lead and it seems that morrison used doherty as almost a fig leaf so he didn't have to actually own the decision he wants to make the victorian government takes other modeling again that the challenge is then to own these really tough ethical decisions because it isn't easy there is there are deaths on both sides of the equation and how we mediate that um, has to be where science meets art, which has always uh, been what politics is about. Absolutely. But, you know, let's for Australia for the last 20 years, and it's almost a uniquely Australian phenomena. For 20 years, we've said the economic modelling says we have to cut taxes for rich people. For the economic modelling says we have to cut taxes for companies. The economic modelling says we can't have a carbon price. Now the epidemiological modelling says we have to open up. My PhD is in macroeconomic modelling. This does not happen in America. This does not happen in England. This does not happen almost anywhere else in the world. Leaders in Australia have used modelling to, to dress up self-interest and political interest as national interest. Mm. And I really think they're going to come a cropper trying to do it with life and death rather than with dollars and cents. Yeah, um, speaking of the abuse of modelling, um, the number one question here is, um, what is the likelihood of a federal election in November so that the Prime Minister can say government is in tech caretaker mode at COP Glasgow and make no climate concessions or <laughs> commitments? Um, Catherine, we get a question on climate and what are we going to do about it? How do we get around this government kind of every week i know it's your favorite um, oh yeah it is my favorite <laughs> um no <laughs> well that's quite a theory um uh, look, uh, I, I think the election will be uh, my, my own personal bet and uh, none of us have a crystal ball in this conversation. I hope, I hope that message has been received. There is no predictions here. What my um, best judgment is as of today could be different next week, but as of today, I think the most likely thing the Prime Minister will do will be come back after Australia Day uh, and uh, call the election in late January for March. Um, I suspect the government's not going to want to do another budget if they don't need to. And I suspect the Prime Minister will hope to bounce off a, a, a summer where uh, the weather's been better, people's mood have improved, perhaps some lockdowns have eased and, and sort of go in, basically uh, call an election round about that time. That's my current, that's my current feeling for what it's worth. In terms of uh, what's going to happen at Glasgow, well, that is still kicking around the government. Uh, you know what will what will say or or not say. Uh, obviously, the National Party are pretty major players in that, uh, but also uh, moderate Liberals are players in that as well. Uh, and we've seen some positioning around that. That's that's sort of quite interesting in terms of uh, just pushing, you know, pushing at least for a formal commitment on net zero and other things. So anyway, um, we just got to, we've just got to wait and see what comes out uh, the other side of a negotiation with the National Party. Um, one imagines what comes out the other side of that uh, isn't enough. <laughs> but uh, again, you know, um, let's, let's just, let's just watch this play out. And uh, and I won't be sparing any well I won't be sparing any direct speech in judgments once I've seen the facts of what the government's prepared to stump up. Yeah, Richard, um, you've been watching climate politics for a long time as well. What are your predictions as we head to Glasgow? Uh, well, I agree with Catherine. I've always thought the election will be March or April next year. I'm unchanged on that. Um, uh, look, my, my fear is that we do what we always do in Australia, which is when we're under pressure, we pretend to do something and then not really do it. 
So I, I think that in the lead up to Glasgow, we'll hear some sort of announcement uh, that can be dog whistled perfectly, that it'll allow Scott Morrison to show up at Glasgow and say, there you go, international community. And at the same time, be able to say, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you, you know that counts for nothing, don't you? So let's, let's not under, underestimate the cynicism or pragmatism uh, of this government. Uh, these are the people that remove the carbon price uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, have, have, have set out to destroy all of the architecture. You know, the only reason we still have the CFC and ARENA and all those bodies is not because the government wants them there, but because the Senate kept them there. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think we'll hear some, some, some deliberately, carefully selected platitudes which can still be explained to the, the tail that wags this government's dog. Um, I can see in the comments there, I've had a really good suggestion from Nigel, who said we should do a poll of everyone on here if they've been vaccinated or plan to. So I might get the exact wording on that question from you, uh, John, and we'll do that next fortnight. I think that would be interesting to see how many of us um, are fully vaccinated or intending to be. I will just go back to the final couple of points, Pete, uh, from the slides. Yeah, you want to take you. a look um, at this? Uh government response yeah i look for all the discussion today what did surprise me this week um and catherine and i discussed it last night as well the um very good and quite good you can see there's an uptick in federal government response but also in the responses in new south wales and victoria of their state government so you know it it, it feels you'd have to see the trend lines over a couple more weeks but it feels like at least in this little wave of um, call and response, we've hit a bit of a nadir. Um, I think you can see it in New South Wales, you can see it in Victoria. Um, I think that is because people want to hear that lockdowns are going to end at some point and it's in sight. And it is a natural response, but I, I do think it's important to see that when informing a lot of the discussions around public health, that we recognise that these arguments are playing out in an environment where people want to believe that they can come out the other end sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, so I'll take another couple more questions before we... Um, Wrap up, um, Catherine, this one might be for you as well. There's a question here from Philip around views on the Keneally O'Neill stoush and whether it will impact badly on Labor at the next federal election. Um, and is it too late for Labor to go forward with a rank and file pre-selection? Yes, I did miss that. Sorry, in my um, in my opening wrap up, that, that's been another moving part over the last couple of days, we've seen uh, uh, Christina Keneally uh, make a play for, well, she she will on current indications be pre-selected for Fowler. Uh, we've also seen, also seen Joel Fitzgibbon uh, surprise no one, well, certainly not me, by saying that he's not going to recontest and that opens up uh, a process of pre-selection in the Hunter. Um, look, I think we've seen uh, some really, um, uh, valid debates um, over the last couple of days about whether the whether representation adequately reflects the communities being represented. Um, I think they're valid conversations to have. Um, and, uh, and we've certainly seen that in the debate over whether or not uh, Christina Keneally should displace uh, a Vietnamese lawyer uh, for the Western Sydney seat of Fowler. Um, I, I don't think diversity will be the question in the Hunter, but, uh, but nonetheless, there'll be some positioning around that seat as well. In terms of, I think the, the sort of crux of the question was, does it make it more difficult for Labor or does it sort of, it just remind me, Ed, what was the crux of the question there? Um, it was around whether or not it will harm Labor's chance. Harm Labor, that's it. Yeah, that, that was what I had in my mind. Does it harm Labor? Well, look, Fowl is a very safe Labor seat, um, uh, but look, who knows? Uh, does the debate generally harm Labor? Well, I, I suspect not, although it does, um, 
that, that uh, I suppose the thing it does draw attention to is that the that sort of power in the Labor Party these days is more fragmented than it once was. Um, it's sort of, uh, you know, there's been this interesting tussle in the New South Wales right that couldn't be resolved, uh, despite Christina Keneally's seniority, Deb O'Neill was going to get a higher spot on the Senate ticket because of her institutional support. Uh, once upon a time, you know, the great, the self-styled great men of the New South Wales right would have come in, cracked heads and fixed that. Uh, we're not in an environment where that happens anymore because power is much more dispersed between individuals. Now, does that make it more messy for Labor? Does it possibly, possibly, um, but we've got a way to play out, I think, before we can be definitive about that. Yeah, um, I can see in the chat here, uh, Russell Johnston, you saying that your daughter in Canberra hasn't been able to access a vaccine for at least several weeks and that her GP advised against AZ. Russell, you should call your daughter and say, uh, we definitely know that Canberra's got uh, more vaccine supplies coming. And if people are already uh, booked in, they've been advised to call and see if they can move up their uh, vaccination appointment. I think we're getting more Pfizer in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, just some news for uh, people watching from Canberra. Um, Richard, just finally, before um, we go, here in Canberra, our lockdown's been um, extended, but a lot of the debate has really, it's being driven by what's happening in New South Wales. The ACT obviously is wholly within New South Wales, but it's going to impact on other states as well. Just looking ahead as things deteriorate, as the cases peak in New South Wales, how do you think that'll shift the debate or change the views of um, other premiers? What are they weighing up as they're looking at... Um, their plans out of lockdown? Uh, yeah, well, to be clear, the, the term state borders does not appear in the Doherty modelling. The scenario, the scenario imagined by the Doherty modellers was of a small cluster of, of uh, infected people spread evenly across Australia. So the thought experiment that led to these 70 and 80% sort of arbitrary thresholds, the thought experiment was not what if you had a state that had over a thousand cases a day and you were surrounded by it or you live next door to it? There's nothing in the Doherty modelling to help a state leader make that decision. Andrew Barr, the ACT chief minister, is obviously struggling with, I think we've had eight different people from New South Wales bring the virus into Canberra now, eight. So we haven't had one incursion that's then spread We've, we've actually, we've been fending off eight incursions, as I understand it. Uh, so it's very hard for us to keep it under control when New South Wales keeps infecting us. Uh, other states with uh, less people living in those border communities, um, you know, they've, they've done better so far. But, you know, the, the, the national plan required each premier to look after their own patch. But of course, Gladys just turned that on her head and went, oh, it got out of control here. The national plan says you can't discriminate against New South Wales. So I, I can't see the West Australian, Queensland or Tasmania Premier doing anything that uh, sees their states open up to risk until they're way over 80% vaccination. So I think, as, as Catherine said earlier, it started with 70 to 80, which got interpreted as 70. You just don't even hear them talk about Doherty modelling much at the moment. I think you're going to start to see 80, oh, we meant 80% of the over 12s, oh, we meant, we meant. I think the, the, the states that are COVID zero and the ACT are desperate to see more like 90% vaccination before they let this rip through not just their vulnerable communities, but through their communities. Yeah, funny how we don't hear much about the Tasmanian <laughs> Premier. Sorry. <laughs> no, just very quickly, I know we're right up against it here. Just on the Doherty modelling, just because I imagine people will be interested because we've canvassed this a lot today. Uh, they're, 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 there is this adjustment uh, going to the National Cabinet meeting on Friday. Doherty was asked by the Premiers, by members of the National Cabinet, to look at their assumptions in the light of current evidence and present an update. And that's been in process for the last couple of weeks, which is one of the reasons we're not hearing as much about it as we have done. But that's not to obviate Richard's point is that like, there might be a common sense reason 
but there's also a there's also a, um, a, just a bureaucratic reason. It's 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 there's a recut and it's going back to national cabinet on Friday. Great. So we might hear more about it then. Um, I want to thank everyone. We had nearly a thousand people on the line with us today. Thanks so much for all your fantastic questions. Uh, you can find all the essential poll results and Catherine and Pete's analysis on Guardian Australia. Uh, you can find Richard's explainer of some of the assumptions behind the Doherty Institute modelling at australiainstitute.tv. Uh, that's our YouTube channel. You can just Google Australia Institute YouTube and you should be able to find those videos there. Um, and we've got some exciting more, uh, more webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next week, we'll be talking to Senator Sarah Hanson Young about media diversity. She's the chair of the current Senate inquiry into media diversity in Australia. We'll be looking at what inspiration we can take from the Nordic countries when it comes to supporting public broadcasting and other measures that help uh, support media diversity. And obviously, we've seen a lot of newsrooms close around Australia, not just through the pandemic, but prior to that as well should be really great please join us for that one um, and thanks to all of our panelists today thanks John Richard Catherine and Pete as always uh, we'll hopefully see you in two weeks um, and don't forget to check out the Australia Institute's podcast as well follow the money you can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts although as I said at the top here <laughs> The last couple of topics have been quite depressing and I was in a really bad mood last week. I'm not sure what's shifted, if it's the sunshine or what. Uh, I'm in a much better mood uh, this week um, and in the next day or two, our episode will be on uh, our new report from the Centre for Future Work on job losses in the university sector. Um, so I know that'll impact on a lot of people. Tune in for that one uh, when it's up. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you in a fortnight. Stay safe. Get back. To we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.